Hey everyone, this is Keith Scott from out in Sydney, Australia. I'm one of the voices of Bullwinkle J. Moose. It's time to watch Relentless and Unstoppable. And so give it up for your main hosts, Douglas Kenny and Andy McPhee. Hey everybody, this is Doug Kenny and welcome to Relentless and Unstoppable. We have another amazing guest coming on the channel today, so please hit like and subscribe. And after this episode, please stay tuned to the RNU channel for more amazing guests. Let's get this on! Hey everybody, how you doing? Just a, a quick uh, little share of why I started Relentless and Unstoppable. It was for one very simple reason, because of Doug Kenny. Nothing to do with me at all, zero. I was just coaching Doug and he took on the coaching and mentoring and he made all the changes. He took all the suggestions from his his parents as well as my, my coaching, but it was all about Doug, his breakthrough and his weight loss, uh, he, his willingness to accept that uh, he is dealing with high functioning autism and, and other issues, but he's never quit, he's never given up. So we did one interview with him to share his story and then we decided to start interviewing other people. And Doug has now taken over the whole channel and he does all the interviews. He runs everything. He's just an amazing young man. So RNU was born from simply what an amazing young man Doug is and his story needed to be shared. Hey everybody, this is Doug Kenny from Relentless and Unstoppable. We have Andy McPhee, my coach and mentor, just fresh out of an amazing role in the kingdom of the planet of the apes. And we have our guest, Richard Norton, who is also fresh out of a film called Furiosa. How you doing, Richard? Very good, thank you, Doug. Andy, how are you both? Glad to be there with you. Yeah, good day, mate. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations on uh, Furiosa too. It's really um, it's getting a lot of great hype over here in LA, as I'm sure you know anyway. And back home, it's already open back home in Australia, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yeah. yeah. I wish the box office had been better, Andy. You know what it's like. It's a bit of a streaming age now and you can't It tell. is, yeah. yeah. It's so hard to predict anymore and it deserves like all the accolades the reviews have been great the performance have been mm. great but who you know it's it's always hard to predict as you well know what the box office is going to do with things like this but there you go yeah yeah you're right though it's, i mean it's probably another another day for another subject but yeah everything is really changing the, the world's changing really quickly really quickly at the moment you know i mean it's all great technology it's not against it or anything but I think some things you've got to be a little wary of, like what what are going to be the consequences, especially in our industry, the film industry, authors, writers, actors, voiceover, commercials, all that sort of stuff, you know, um, that you hope it doesn't affect people's jobs, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, right. uh, Doug. What's the question, I, sir? Hit me. All right. Oh, uh, that is, first... I, yeah. I wish <laughs> I could, but I'm not there. So, Richard, uh, my first question I have is, uh, what's the movie Furiosa that you've been in? Well, Furiosa, of course, is the latest installment of the Mad Max franchise, directed by the amazing Dr. George Miller. Um, it's a prequel for those who were lucky enough to go and see Fury Road, which we shot, I think, in 2013. That was setting up, you know, the Mad Max character and also was was very much about Furiosa. So this is a prequel that shows the journey from a little girl growing up through her teens and how the um, character became what she became, how she lost her arm as Furiosa, et cetera, et cetera. And because it's a prequel set 10 years earlier, they had a younger actor rather than Charlize Theron. The actor, as you know, is Anya Taylor-Joy, who's, you know, absolutely amazing. I think Anya was about 26 when we shot Furiosa. And uh, they had another younger actor play against the, the Furiosa character when she was still just, you know, a child. Um, and it's incredible because it's, again, it's her journey 
And it's a little different from Fury Road. Fury Road, you know, I, I don't want to be too simplistic, but it's really about a, a war rig, a truck that kind of left here, went there, turned around and went back. And it's everything that happened on the way, on that journey to what they call a green place, this mythical sort of green place that all these Furiosa was trying to find. So this this is five chapters in Furiosa, and it's more or less telling the story of different characters, the people leader, et cetera, et cetera, and how different characters became what they became in the Fury Road movie. Um, so it's it's a, probably a more of a storytelling, but for me, it's the color. It's just like a grand color stunt extravaganza because the stunts are incredible in it, of course. You know, my good mate Guy Norris was the action sequence coordinator and, and designer. And all the stunties and everybody involved just an, did an unbelievable job. I mean, anyone who gets a chance to go, and you need to see it in a theatre because the sound is incredible, the colours are incredible. It's just grand-scale filmmaking. And to see these vehicles flying through the air and motorbikes and the different stunts, it's it's just incredible. Chris Hemsworth, of course, is the main uh, villain in the movie. And for those who haven't seen it, you almost won't recognize him. He's got a bit of a hooked nose. They've changed his appearance. I think I think, probably rightfully so. Otherwise, people would be seeing Thor running around, you know, in the, in the <laughs> apocalyptic landscape. So, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, Chris is incredible. Chris, you know, what a professional. Yeah, I've got to tell you, and I, I love telling the story when uh, – Am I allowed to swear on your podcast, um, Doug? Yeah. All right. So yeah, you know, I'm the I'm, editor. You can. <laughs> I was. I'd been on the shoot. In by the way, we shot it all in Australia this time. Um, it was shot in Newcastle and Sydney. Some of the studios stayed in Sydney and another place called Hay. Uh, which, by the way, was where the original Furiosa was. Um, sorry, Fury Road was supposed to be shot. And just before we started uh, Fury Road, there were unseasonable rains and everything turned green, which didn't match, of course, the apocalyptic barren landscape that George Miller needed for the movie. Hence, we headed off to South Africa and shot it there. Now with the technology, even if you had that same situation with landscape and greenness and everything else, they can just they can just take out everything in the far as background and replace it. In other words, the the CGI or special effects and and all of that that they can do are just of a standard. You could shoot that film almost anywhere and have what you required, you know, for the look of the movie. But anyway, getting back to Chris, yes, yeah, so I'm on the phone. I'd been working about three weeks and I called Judy, my wife, and how's it going? Oh, that down. She said, oh, have you met Chris yet? And I said, yeah, yeah, I met him. Uh, a week ago, she said, oh, oh what do you think? I said, fuck him. She starts <laughs> laughing. He's like, what do you mean, fuck him? I said, no, fuck him. He's six foot four. He's built like a brick shit house. I said, he's even got perfect skin. And to boot, he's just the nicest guy you could ever meet. I said, nobody deserves all of that. Just give me a through few more weeks. I'll find something wrong with that bastard. <laughs> he was laughing my head off because he, he's so committed. I, I asked George about working with Chris because I, I sort of like to get into people's heads. And he just, he was just, he said he couldn't say enough nice things. He said, you couldn't get a more committed and professional actor. He had suggestions mm. for his character and all of that. But in the end run, when George decided what it is he wanted of the character, he would basically aye, aye, captain, you know, and you can't ask for more mm. from an actor, I don't think, to have input, mm. to have opinions and everything else, and then hand it over to the captain of the ship, which is George. Um, mm. But, but yeah, I, I think Chris is an amazing guy, mate. Like, he's a machine, isn't he? Like, what he okay. puts his body through to you to build up, then, then he lets it go and gets back to his normal body weight size and like that's a huge amount of stress and and plus doing the dialogue the stunts whatever it's amazing you know yeah, he, he can do it all he absolutely can do it all i mean i didn't have to do anything with him because it's almost what can you show chris physically that he can't and or hasn't already done and uh yeah but it was uh, you know i learned a lot you know uh doug and andy just watching chris as i said it's you you 
I often ask why somebody in my own head has the careers they have and the success. And when you see people like that work, it's about commitment. It's about passion. They're just so mm -hmm. absolutely committed to what they're doing. In other words, you could say, well, he's earning X amount of money. He could almost sleepwalk his way through the role and be okay. But it's mm -hmm. not about that. It's about absolute conviction and passion and, and commitment to just being the best version of themselves when they play these roles. And I've got to say, Anya was the same. I mean, if you look at Anya, she had a few issues. You can tell by interviews about the lack of dialogue. There's probably 30 lines in the whole movie. But that's, that's George's vision. It was about the eyes. It was about the face. And it was about sort of telling the story with very, very few words, which is, mm. again, very typical of the Mad Max movies. And the strength of her character, you know, she's got these incredibly big eyes, as you know, and when you see mm. that on a big screen and she's telling the story with those looks and with that intention, man, I think it, it's absolutely riveting. And, uh, yeah, so it's 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 an amazing film. And, I, and again, anyone who hasn't seen it, I really recommend you go and have a look. It's it's cinema at its best. And I, and mm. I also want to say about George, I you know, I always say George is, you know, obviously working with him on Fury Road and now this one. He's like he's like the sweet uncle you wish you had. He's the nicest man. He's very softly spoken. Mm. But I tell you what, and I was told this, people often underestimate George because he's so nice. But that every every frame of that film, and the same with Fury Road, has got George Miller's fingerprints on it. There's not a scratch on a vehicle, a rip on a bit of a mm. costume or a gesture of an actor that's not through George's direction. And um mm. it's his baby. I mean, how long ago since the very first Mad Max and now we're up to number four or whatever it is. And mm. I, I, I one day I was watching they had a zoom shot a, a drone shot, you know, which of course a little electronic drones with a camera. There must have been 25 characters in this shot there were the bikers the bikes are lying on the ground they're lying on the ground you could hardly see them you know the characters looked about that big in the monitor but george systematic oh could you move his just move his foot six inches that way oh just mm. turn the bike wheel a little bit you realize you're watching like a rembrandt painting this this mm -hmm. incredible canvas so the the attention to deal because he 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 I, I'm sure it was him that told me once, whatever shot ends up on that celluloid in the finished product is there forever. So you want to make sure that every frame is exactly what it should be and the excellence of, of the construction of that shot is just mm. so incredibly important, meaning there's no frame that's not worth his attention, you know? And yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, I just thought that was phenomenal, you know, watching watching George Jewish thing. But you know, he's funny too, Rich. He doesn't, um, and Doug, you might not know this, his auditions haven't changed. Like I've auditioned for, uh, I think, a couple of, I think I've auditioned for a couple of the Mad Maxes, right? And mm -hmm. and the auditions are the same. Like he has the same monologue every time. I, it's, I don't know whether he changes it for certain characters, but... Um, yeah, he's had that for years and years. Yeah, well, he's changing, but in, you'll often give them uh, monologues out of different movies. Often yeah. it's nothing to do with the actual Mad Max movie. He's about he's about finding the person that is as close to the character they're going to yeah. play as possible. And so, you know, like Tom Burke, who I spent a lot, lot of time with, he plays Praetorian Jack, you know, he's training... Uh, Tom getting him into the gym and fit and everything else. We got on so well, but he he basically George saw a, a movie that Tom did that he really liked. Had a Zoom call with him. There was no real audition, and based on the Zoom call and what he saw of a completely different movie, that's how Tom got cast in mm. the role of Praetorian Jack. <clears throat> so it's it's interesting, you know. I I remember that the reason I was told that Tom Hardy, for instance ended up playing the Mel Gibson, you know, role mm. as far as Mad Max, was that Tom was the closest in real life to a Mel Gibson that George had come across. Like, he's quite, 
He's very intense. You know, mm. he's got certain energy. He's almost, you're not even sure what's going to come out of his mouth at times. And he, he just had that frenetic sort of energy that George resonated with, hence him being cast, you know, in the role, aside from being an amazing actor, of course. Mm -hmm. So mm. I think you know, it's pretty interesting, you know, the whole process. But as you know, Andy, it wasn't like, here's a scene from the movie. I want you to do it and play the character. Yeah, he, yeah. He just assesses the personality and the quirkiness or whatever it is. And based on that, his instincts tell him that this person is capable of bringing, bringing to that character in Furiosa or, or Fury Road what, what he really wants. And it's quite a fascinating yeah. Process and yeah, he's an is. amazing judge of character. Of character, yeah, yeah, for sure, he'd it, have to be, and that's that's why I like the fact that he uses that same uh, monologue all the time. And and you know, as you know, as an actor, you might do a few of these auditions over the years, and you don't get them, and and it's not because of any particular reason that you've not shown him. It's he's not seeing what he wants in the character he already has in mind. It's got nothing to do with, 100%. did you do a bad job? No, you just don't fit what he sees that person as being. And like you just said, he might not even have someone to do that monologue. Just talking to them, he's like, oh, right, okay. You're exactly. what I want. Gee, that's all we have for Relentless and Unstoppable. So tune into the next episode to hear more amazing stories from amazing guests. This is Keith Scott from Sydney, Australia saying so long and uh, I'm smarter than the average bear. Gee.